well, and this is another example of a calculated spin rate that is absolutely not right. So never, ever, ever practice any spin related stuff based on calculated numbers. Mario, here we are. Let's go, a little bit of a different session today. So I do have my foresight, quad, and a trackman four. And I want to do a little bit of a different session today. It's not about speed today because, well, speed is great, but for long drive, it takes a bit more. And I have two devices today. I want to compare the two and I want to walk you through an entire technique session that I do to launch it right. Alrighty guys, it's not always about the speed. Speed is great, speed is actually very forgiving, but today I have a quad down here, which is a video device, and to the right down there, I have the trackman. I have it elevated a bit already because I'm teeing up so high, so sometimes it helps. But first, we need to turn off this and this. So I don't have to yell that much. A few moments later. Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, God! Oh, Yeah! Yes! Come on! Alrighty, let's go. Oh, where's my wedge? So, as usual, the boring stuff. You gotta warm up the wrists. Already, right now, I try to prime in the direction that I want to practice. So, today it's all about launching it right and spinning it right. What does that mean? Speed is amazing. And to have, like, crazy high speeds is very forgiving out there, too. Because when you, like, max out a 230 ball speed, your bad shots are still at like 218 and balls like those are still going a far away. Yes, speed is great, but when you don't launch it right and you don't spin it right, you don't hit it far. And we're not playing fast drive, we're playing long drive. And I actually like to use certain sessions when my CNS is depleted anyways, and I'm not, not probably not fast because for two days I've been speed training. I speed trained yesterday and the day before. We're getting faster, which is pretty good. But today is, it's not about speed. Today is about launching it right. All right, seven irons, just warming up. And right here, I really try to use the principles that I want to use with driver two. It doesn't make sense for golf, but this is an extreme motion that I try to do. So when I'm swinging back, basically right here, because I'm using this trigger move to the right, Right here, I already try to shift back to the left side, something we call a counterfall, to fall to the left side, and then push back to the right. And that push back, so it's a very dynamic motion. There's a lot of motion going on. This is how I learned golf. How people taught me to play golf. It's a dynamic sport. There's athletes out there. So why don't you leave these dynamic motions to the athletes and let the athlete do what an athlete is supposed to do? Right? So what we try to do is a lot of motion before I actually take away the club, then move to the right, move back left, and then boom, power over to the right back again. And that move to the right, that shift in transition actually allows me to hit up on the ball a lot because that's what we want to do. And I practiced that with irons already to prime myself. And as soon as we switch to drivers, I show you why we actually do that. before I actually take away the club is my trigger move. So everybody's got their own ones, disclaimer up front. So how I do it is actually, or came about by me trying to feel the ground in transition before I actually take away the club. So in the very beginning, when I was working on my ground reaction forces, boom, towards the impact zone, I try to feel where to push. So this is how, how that move actually came about. But what you want to do is, especially the longer the club gets, especially with drivers, and you see that a bit on tour as well, not as extreme, but a bit of it. You want to shift to the right and load that right side before that club actually leaves the ground. You see that with all the 
elite long drivers out there, all of them. They shift right before they actually take away the club because you can load that shaft more, load everything more, and then fall back to the left, as I said before, and boom, explode to the right. That actually came about by, well, trying to feel the ground, but the most important bit is actually shift to the right before you take away the club. And the easiest way to do this is get on your left side and have some pressure on your left and then shift right before you do it. You've seen Kyle Berkshire do this like rocking motion, right? And people got obsessed by it and they tried it back home and so on and so forth. I mean, it was back in the days, it was his way of shifting to the right. Everybody's different. And well, he figured out that's the best way for him to do it at that point in time. But well, it's not necessarily the best for everybody. But you want to shift right before you take away the, the club. Shift right. Now comes the important bit, driver. Your speed is only as good as your launch conditions are. So as a long driver, basically what you try to do is, the faster you get, the higher you try to launch it, and the lower you try to spin it. So that's the rule of thumb. Like a, an old lady that's not as fast as long drivers wants to spin it a bit more to keep the ball up in the air, right? But I'm talking long drive, so I try to launch it as high as I can, like let's say 16 plus, sometimes even 19 up to 20 and spin it definitely sub 2000. Sometimes I even try to launch it like 1600. So anything between 1600 and 2000 is ideal in most conditions, like 80% of the time. Obviously when it's into wind, you wanna launch it lower with low spin. And when it's downwind, you wanna launch it high, but with a bit more spin, because that downwind is actually pushing the ball down kind of. So you wanna keep it up in the air because what, what the spin is actually doing, it's creating lift and keeps the ball up in the air. And well, when there's too much spin, like 3000 or whatever, or even like 2700, all the energy you put into the ball is going up in the air, not forward. So we want that boom energy to go forward. And when it's downwind, you want a bit more spin because it keeps the ball up in the air for longer and the wind has more uh, time to actually push it. Enough set, let's try it out. Very, very important. Balls spin differently. All of them have different spin conditions at impact. Also down there, like down grid, what's happening in the air is a completely different story that's not measurable with the foresight. That's more of a topic for, for the trackman because it's a radar device that's actually tracking the ball. But to get the launch conditions right already at impact, I wanna hit the competition balls when I'm not going for speed, but I'm going for launch conditions. What I do then, I grab myself a couple competition balls for today. Should be enough, we're not going for speed, so we'll save a couple of these for the speed sessions. <laughs> always, when I go for launch conditions, I always wanna play the balls that I use in competition too, because, well, it doesn't make sense to practice with a different ball. When that spins higher or lower, well, it's no practice, right? So always try to use the competition balls. Or, when you have to practice out at a driving range, try to compare your range balls with the balls you have in competition indoors disclaimer don't steal range balls but compare the two and then find a ratio or whatever how much less or how much more usually more they spin and then you can practice for that certain number all right so that's the first number that i have and that's 2600 spin way too much because i caught it low in the face balls low in the face generally spin more, balls high in the face spin less. Also balls high in the face launch higher, low in the face launch lower. So that low part of the club is actually, well, not the best part of the club for long drive. So high in the face is usually a lot better and even when you lose a little bit of speed, sometimes the balls high in the face are the longest ones. But what we wanna do is, we also wanna compare the two devices and Trackman has some weaknesses indoors to capture spin. So what I do is, to, to make this a fair competition or whatnot, I stick these metal dots onto the balls because these are the Trackman metal dots and when you put them on the balls, Trackman gets some, some additional reflections of the spin rate, so it reads the spin rates a lot better. So I stuck the metal dot on onto this ball, place it like this. The metal dot is looking up in the air. And then let's hit one and compare the two numbers we're getting. 
So I got 2300, 20 lounge. And now you can see this one and this one are almost identical. So as long as the spin rate of a trackman is not italic, it's just a normal number. It's a measured spin rate and then these numbers are like almost identical. So plus minus like 50 or something. So very, very good. When the number is taught by Trackman, sometimes very, very bad when it's not. So never, ever, ever practice any spin related stuff based on calculated numbers. For most amateurs out there, Trackman has it dialed in, so numbers are okay. I mean, most amateurs don't know what a spin rate is anyway. So those calculated spin rates are okay most of the time, and also Trackman got this new ball, the Titleist RCT and so on, that, that's capturing the spin better. But I've done some testing, and well, it, in my opinion, there's no difference between the metal dot and the RCT ball, but convenience. You just, well, you don't need to stick a dot onto the ball, you just drop down a ball and it works, right? So that's, that's the biggest difference. But what's actually way more interesting with Trackman and Foresight is spin axis indoors. Let's get into that. So, boom, launch it high. So we want 19 launch, let's go. 19.8. That was not hit hard but it went like 350 meters a carry. So that's how much the spin conditions do. It's crazy how good they are and how, how, how important they are. And whoa, look at this. This is something ridiculous. So this is the actual spin rate that I was hitting, 1600. It was a little high in the phase. That's why, well, it, it spun fairly low and it launched high, which is awesome for long drive. This one shows 4,000 calculated spin. If you would try to change something based on that number, well, you're f right? Don't do that. So whenever you see italic numbers, just forget about them. Forget about them. Oh. That's actually very, very interesting in terms of spin axis. Very interesting. That was a miss hit. I hit that one like super healy right there. And that actually creates a positive spin axis. And I know that. I know how my balls fly outdoors. I have kind of a good feel for ball flight, kind of. This is about the spin axis that I would expect. This is about the spin rate that I would expect because it was low heel. This right here, the spin axis on Trackman, a minus or a negative 19, which is left, which would be a hooking ball, is number one, italic, so it's calculated all the spin axes of um, Trackman are calculated anyways. But this is not correct. This is more or less what I would expect. I can't really tell what, the right, what right or wrong is or what the perfect number is, but I can definitely call minus 19 is not correct. And well, whenever you see that indoors with a Trackman, don't practice based on that. On miss hits, sometimes Trackman gives you some funky reads. Better. 1500 spin well and this is another example of a calculated spin rate that is absolutely not right this is about right 1500 it was also this impact location is not right anyways this was not low toe it was high toe definitely high toe and that's probably one of the reasons why trackman gives you a spin rate of 4300 for some reason, rat the ball low in the face. That's why it feels like, okay, it's gotta be a high spin rate because I didn't see it. So that, let's throw a four, four, three at you. So very, very interesting. But my message right here is both systems are great. They have their strengths and weaknesses. But whenever you see a calculated number, so an italic number on Trackman, forget about it. Don't practice based on it. Guys, if you like this type of content, please leave me a like. It really helps me to grow my channel. Also, whatever you want to know, drop me a comment down below. Maybe another question for the next Q&A. Also, if you have not yet subscribed, please subscribe. Female, male, I don't care. We grow this. Also, I do have a Patreon. I offer access to close friends list on Instagram. It's my speed slide deck that I've been developing over the last two years 
and all kinds of different services. Check it out. I'll leave that link in the description below. Let's go. So you guys sent me a bunch of questions on YouTube as well as on Instagram. And I wanna pick a few of those. And again, I got 10 seconds to answer each of them. Do you feel carry distance numbers on GC Quad are a little exaggerated on higher end ball speeds? The short answer is yes. So what the algorithm does, not only on ball speed, but especially on high launch and low spin, I think it overreads distance a little bit, but well, to be honest, I don't really care because balls go different distance out there all the time. So it depends on the condition. So I don't practice for a certain distance on the quad. I practice for numbers on the quad. What is the perfect number for spin? I mean, we've been going through this. Generally, you can say there's no perfect number. The faster you go, the higher you want to launch and the lower you want to spin it but it also depends on conditions. So there's no perfect number, but for most amateurs, keeping the spin lower compared to how you do right now is probably a good way to go. Do you think you're swinging the club efficiently? Because the smash factor doesn't add up to 1.5. I did a video on this comparing the Trackman smash factor and the quad smash factor. Check out the video right here. I explained why the smash factor is different on both of the devices. Do you try to feel your club head during the swing? Not really, to be honest. So as soon as I take away the club, it's just a fluid motion. And what I do is sometimes I play around with swing weight. So for a long time, for the last two years, I was using a very light grip, which makes the top end of the club very heavy. It feels very heavy. Then I felt it a bit more. Now I've been switching back to a little bit of a heavier grip and the club head doesn't feel as heavy. So to be honest with you, I don't feel it as much. It's more of a fluid motion and the club head is the last piece that it's actually, that's actually moving. That was hit middle middle. That was pretty good. So let's see. Perfect read on this. 2300. 2300 right so as long as it reads it's pretty damn accurate pretty much the same that was a good comparison now let's get into look the the spin rate on that one is a little too high so let's work on getting that one sub 2000 so how do i do it first things first we tee up high so that's one of the most important bits actually tee up high so i use this tee claw as well to get a little bit more tee height and well now, since since 2020, I believe, these T-claws are actually allowed in competition. Very interesting. So you could actually cheat a little bit and, well, make that T-length longer than four inches. So my T's are almost four inches. So with a T-claw, when I don't have to stick it in the ground, I definitely get a little bit more T-height. So this one is like super high. When you like tee up this ridiculously high, you're basically forced to hit up on the ball. And what you want to avoid is doing this. Boom, wipe the ball from over the top like this. Boof. That cannot create positive angle of attacks or maybe like zeros sometimes, but don't do that. So what I want you to do is really feel that left side, really feel that left foot. And from here, once you're here, once you've reached the highest point in your backswing, boom, explode to your right. That's what I want you to do. So let's see if we can create some 1800 spin balls right here by exploding off to the right. Let's go, come on. Well, that's a 1600. Generally, the higher the speed goes, so the faster the balls are, well, the harder it is for Trackman to actually pick it up. Trackman measures or tries to see half revolutions till it hits the screen. My screen, is 480 meters away and well until the ball hits the screen the ball doesn't make as many revolutions as, as it does outdoors right so trackman has a way harder time to actually measure the spin till it hits the screen and then well at some point up to a speed of like let's say 170 175 ball speed it works fairly good but once you touch like 200 ball speed most of the time you see like italic spin rates. That's the way it is. Three six, one six. Way different. Don't practice based on the italic number. 
Very important, by the way, when I practice this, I always practice based on these data points down there. So I turn off all the unnecessary data points at that point of time. So I unselect everything but what I want to work on. Sometimes I, well, at like angle of attack when I really want to see what I'm doing, but this is the result I want to see. And this is what I practice. Sometimes it makes sense to turn on like angle of attack and spin loft maybe because that's how the numbers are being created. But what I definitely want to turn off in these moments is club speed and ball speed. Because as soon as I see a number that's, well, that I don't like as much, I start to push speed. And on these days, it doesn't make sense to push speed for me. I want to practice a certain motion. Well, and this simply stops me from being stupid sometimes. Okay, let's launch one, 20 launch and sub 2000 spin. So what I do is to launch a 20, I move my ball position a bit more to the left, almost like just touching the inside of my left foot. Then I, I tilt my shoulders a bit more to the right and then I try to explode, boom, as much as possible to the right. Uh, not quite there yet. 21 lounge, but the spin rate is just a little bit too high. Just a little bit. This would actually be an amazing ball for downwind. So this one downwind, 21 lounge and 2200 spin, that's pretty cool. That's going forever. Okay, again, boom, strike it a bit better. That was a little low in the face. And boom, boom, boom. Let's go. Getting lower, a little bit lower, getting lower, 200 less. So that's 2,089 at 2,100, 20 lounge. Okay, we want to get it below, we want to get it below 2,000. So then what I try to do is, and how the spin is actually being created, basically spin is the sum of how you hit the ball, so where you strike the ball in the face, as I explained earlier, and the angle of attack plus the dynamic loft, so basically my hand position plus the static loft, my hand position. So what I try now is, I'm like 13 up already, so what I try to do is keep my hands a little more forward to get that spin down a little bit. Same setup, boom, and then hit it like this. There we are! Woo. That's how it's done right there. So 1500 is a good spin number for that lounge, including a speed over like 220 in competition would be balls of like, depending on where you hit, but in Mesquite, sometimes they can go 450 plus. So when it's, when it's downwind or so, and the ground is like fairly hard. Let's see, first competition is in March, early March. Can't wait to play that. Let's go. So I just got a message from my coach Lee Cox. And I mean, we're bouncing like videos back and forth all the time. I was not struggling, but I was asking myself when I'm, when I'm doing this motion, so when I'm, when I'm moving over to the right, too much if I'm losing a bit of vertical because the, the force that's being pointed that direction, so more laterally pushing me over that way, I felt like, well, does that actually take away a bit of the vertical portion because the force is not being pointed vertically rather than like it's, it's being pointed more laterally rather than up. And I just got a message from Lee. I'm not seeing any noticeable differences. I've looked at it 20 times. So we've been comparing one of these swings, which was a 230 ball, and that swing the other day. So, well, that's good. Rhythm and downswing with that red shirt looks a little bit faster, but it's expected with a faster ball speed. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. Okay, Q&A, let's go. If you could build your dream launch monitor, Tell us what features it would have. So there's one thing that I really want to know. It's not only about how it, the ball is being launched, but how much force I put into the handle. So either like gloves that can measure that, not pressure, force. Gloves or like a layer, like a condom on the grip or something that could actually measure the force output on the handle. Because if you would ask me right now, when do you have, what? what's your, When's your biggest force output? The easy answer is I don't know. So that would be absolutely amazing. Also a combination 
of a 3D image of the player and the launch data in one device. In my opinion, that's the future. Recommendation starting long drive. Maximize 46 inches stiff shaft first, then 48, 48 right away. Thank you. Okay, so when you're a good golfer and you know how to manipulate your launch and you can hit different shot shapes, I would recommend you to go to a 48 straight away and learn to handle it because usually it takes a bit of time to get used to the new length and actually get faster with it. Then in theory, eventually you should be faster with a 48, like roughly two miles an hour, a little bit more than two miles an hour club speed per inch. So in my opinion, you cannot go to the 48 in shaft too quickly as long as you know how to play golf. How to create slash gain more speed as a woman. I don't know if there's a difference between the genders. In my opinion, there's not. And all my 0.5% female followers know. <laughs> Why am I faster some days and then slower on others? Yeah, there's so many factors to speed. One is definitely CNS recovery and how ready your CNS is to fire. But, well, it doesn't matter that much to be honest with you because it's perfectly normal that you cycle through speed and this is one of the reasons I do practice sessions like these. This is not a speed day, this is a technique day. So thank God there's different types of, of trainings to actually hit it far. It's not all about speed. It's nice to be fast, it's not everything. Can you compare club path slash swing direction on the quad versus trackman? Been confused about that lately. Well, to put it very Simply, it's not the same. It's two different things. Swing direction is the club path at angle of attack zero. So on the lowest point of your swing arc. Club path is the path of the club at impact. Two completely different things. So especially when you hit very high angle of attacks, like let's say this is the lowest point of your swing arc and you hit the ball right here, you're not moving in a straight line, your arc is a little bent, like this. So the later you hit it, the more you hit up on it, the more you have to swing right at angle of attack zero to square it up at high angle of attacks. So rule of thumb, you want to marry the two, angle of attack and swing direction on trackman. So 10 angle of attack, it's 10 swing direction right. Ice cold beer or cocktail? That's an easy one, takes me three seconds. One, two, three. Diet Coke. Guys, if you like this type of content, please drop me a comment below, especially the comparison between the Quad and the Trackman. I don't want to bash any of these companies, both have their weaknesses and strengths, but I want to ask you, have you worked with launch monitors yet? And what kind of data point have you been looking at? Or was it like primarily the graphics of the Trackman, which is pretty strong on the Trackman side? So leave me a comment down below what you want to see of these types of comparisons and Hope to see you in the next video.